John, if you are able, if you could put Galatians 5 up for us. Verses 22 and 23 before we dive in. We have been doing a series on the fruit of the Spirit. And the whole idea about the fruit of the Spirit is that God is changing us from the inside out. And we would like our outward appearance, which many times does not match our inward appearance, to match the two. But we want to match it from the inside out because that's what God would have for each one of us. That's what God intends for each one of us. So there's this transformation that takes place when we renew our minds, renew our hearts daily. And it takes place from the inside out. So in Galatians, Paul's writing this letter to the church. And he said this. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit. And notice he doesn't say the fruits. But he says the, he says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. Go ahead. Verse 23. Gentleness and self-control. If you could go back, please, John. So... Forbearance is patience. Just so you know, so each week we talked about what these things mean. And the first thing we found out that with love, love is not an option. Love is not this feeling. It's not this emotion. Love is an action. It's taking this, this, this blessing that God has given us because God has said, you're worth being loved. You're worthy of being loved. And all the struggles you've had, all the mistakes you've made, all the past that you want to hold on to, I just want you to let it go. I want you to know I love you just where you sit and right as you are. And I want you to take that action because I took that action by sending my son and I want you to share that with others. And then the next week we talked about it. I said, well, there's joy, joy, Jesus, others, you, which we, you know, we all learned in Sunday school growing up. Jesus, other you, but it's more than that. Outside of that feeling of that joy that we get is the fact that we should be bringing people joy. So we want to be a joy giver as opposed to a joy sucker with those people that just kind of suck the joy out of the room and suck the joy out of every situation. We want to give joy to any situation that we're in. Peace. Jesus said, I will bring a peace that is beyond your understanding. And it's a promise that he gives to each one of us. So I will bring you this peace if you allow it. And so as we go through this love and as we go through this joy and as we're going through this peace, we start to recognize that in each step, that they start to feed off of one another. And then we had to get to the point of patience. And if, if sadly, the, the American prayer is, Lord, give me patience and I want it right now. But realistically, that patience is something that we all tend to have a little more of the older that we get. We tend to sit back a little bit and we start to see things and we're like, why is this getting to me? Why is this bothering me? Why is this causing my blood to boil? Why is this making me angry? And many times... What we find out is what's causing it isn't maybe necessarily the other person's situation. A lot of times it's us. And we need to show that patience in every situation. That led us to kindness, which is an act, right? We have to go out. We need to kill people with kindness. And with kindness, we talked about it. We said, how would you treat someone? I'm sorry. Question one was, how would Jesus treat that person? The person that you're putting down, the person that you're criticizing, the person that you're making fun of. How would Jesus treat that person, number one? And then how would you treat that person if that person were Jesus? Right? That one hurt. But that's kindness. That's our choice of being kind. And then goodness was not an area of, oh, I just want to be good. I want to be good and, you know, every chance I get. It's a doing good. We want to be able to do good. And then the next one, it says faithfulness, which is a fullness of the faith. And gentleness, which we talked about last week. And gentleness is sometimes it's got to be a tough love. Many times it's going to be a tender love. We're going to choose to be tender first, but there are times that we have to be tough. But even in that toughness, that we can be gentle. And so it leads us to the final fruit of the Spirit, that all of these take place because of one another. All these interact because of one another, and that is self-control. Now, if you'll notice, this is the fruit of the Spirit that it's the self that we're now talking about. It's the self that we struggle with. It's our self that is our biggest enemy. It's our self that makes the mistake, that misses the mark, that is unkind, that chooses not to do good, that sucks the joy out of the room, that says, ah, I love just a touchy-feely kind of thing, that, you know what, that whole joy thing, whatever it might be. It's our self that stops us from having the complete maturity that we want to have with God through his spirit through us. So if we can take control of the self-control, all of these other aspects of the fruit of the spirit 
are going to naturally take place in us. But in those areas where we do not have the self-control, if we don't have the self-control, there is no love. There is no joy. There's no peace, no faithfulness. There's no goodness. There's no patience. There's no gentleness. There's no faithfulness. So this is the area, and Paul finishes this because this part is the most difficult for any one of us because there's areas in which we have a lot of self-control. But if I stopped you and said, what's an area that you don't have a lot of self-control in? You could list off two or three things for me right now. I get angry. I have doubt. I have terrible thoughts. I'm anxious. I worry. I have this past thing that I'm trying to fix. I, 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 and all those areas. It's our self that gets in the way of God's fruit of his spirit working through us. Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians, but before we get there, we're going to show you what we chose to do alongside of these messages for the last two and a half months. We decided if we're going to show the fruit of the spirit, we're going to grow fruit at the same time. And so to the left of the driveway, we planted a pumpkin patch that we're going to give away October 20th. Every pumpkin that's out there, it's already earmarked, earmarked. for who we don't know yet. But we can't wait to, be, wait to be able to give those to little kids, to families, to whoever, to show them that the fruit of this church is about the fruit of the Spirit. And so we want to give all of these things away, and it comes from our inside out. So let's look at the first week. This was week one. We had planted the seeds. We weren't sure what was going to come out, but these are the little green things. Week two started to grow. Week three is when we started to see the weeds start to creep in. And so each week when we started talking about all the, the different fruit of the Spirit, we were doing well maybe for the first week and then for the second week, and then all of a sudden those weeds start to creep in and it starts to eat us up from the inside out. Go ahead. There's week four, starting to grow more. Week five. Week six. Now, in week six, if you go back to week five for a second, you'll notice something change. This is all green, and in week six, we start to see the flowering. We start to see the flowers in there. See, it takes time with fruit. We have to cultivate it. With anything that you're going to grow, it takes time to cultivate, to prepare it, to get it ready. And you may not see this fruit for a while. And because of that, we take it to God and say, come on, God, it's Monday. I was just in church yesterday, and I prayed last night, and I prayed today, and I'm not seeing any fruit. Come on, what's going on? And then Tuesday, I prayed again. And then by Friday, huh, you know what? God's really not paying any attention. It takes time. We have to cultivate this. Week seven, we started to see the actual fruit. I'm sorry, week six, we saw the actual fruit. And then here's the whole patch. You can see a little bit of the flowers in there. And you kind of start to see something. And we've said, oh, good. We actually have the fruit that's growing. And then the next week, those are the, those are the, uh, the gatekeepers. Those are the shepherds of the flock. That's our sunflowers. And then we start to see the, the pumpkins are actually turning orange. Go to the next week, and we notice something take place. The vines are starting to die, but what is left is the fruit. See, God gave us this example. Jesus, in his personal ministry, he taught all of the different fruit of the Spirit. He shared it with everyone, even when people put him down, even when people made fun of him, even when people said, you can't do this. And yet, this is what people had been looking for for over 400 years, and even before then, a Messiah is coming. Someone is coming to save us all. And he came and he said, I'm the true vine, but that vine is going to die. And when that vine dies, what is left are the fruit behind. And we'd all love to think that we're immortal, right? Truth is, none of us know how much time we have. We don't know if it's a day. We don't know if it's a week. We don't know if it's a month. So do we want to stay stuck in all this past struggle? Because the Bible says that that fruit of the Spirit should be rising within each one of us. It's going to take time to cultivate. And we're moving forward because sooner or later our vine dies and the fruit that is left behind or are we left behind. So the fruit that is left behind, they're starting to look really, really good. Go ahead to the next one. Now we can see them all over the place. This is our plan to give these away. We want to be a light before our community. We want to be a light before our church family. We want to be a light before all of your friends and family that may come to this. And our hope is to give every single one of these away. Why? Because the week after, Rick and I have to take all these away and throw them all out, whatever's left. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to give them away as much as we can. That's our plan, okay? So week 10, go to the next one. 
If you made any promises during the fourth quarter. <laughs> see, I found the great pumpkin. <laughs> church started today at 1030 on Sunday, September 23rd. Who all made it to church? <laughs> Who made a deal this week? <laughs> just one. Come on. There we go. God, just, I have so many friends who are like, just this one time, Lord, just before I die. And I'm actually rooting for all my friends now because I want them to have that. My sister sent me a text yesterday. And she said, John, they're renaming the stadium the bakery. I'm like, all because of Baker Mayfield. And I mean, it's, it's amazing how something can change in an instant. It's amazing how something can all of a sudden bring us faith. And it could be in a person. It could be in an event. But as believers, we're hoping it's both in a person and in an event when Jesus died on the cross but rose again three days later. And that's the fruit of God's spirit that he left us. Because Jesus said this. He said, trust and believe. That's it. Trust and believe. I have a place for each one of you, for all who trust and believe in me. And how do we share that evidence? How do we become that fruit? Through the fruit of the spirit, through our kindness, through our faithfulness, through our gentleness, through our love through our joy, through our goodness, through patience, and through peace. But it all starts and it all ends for each one of us with, God bless you, with self-control. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is where we're going to be today. This book was written by Paul. Paul wrote most of the letters of the New Testament. However, Luke actually wrote the most verses. This book was actually, people will kind of argue and say this may have been the actual first book that was written in the New Testament, not the Gospels. Some will go back and forth. I'm fine with it either way. But this book, Paul's at the Church of Corinth. Paul was a missionary. He's the greatest missionary that the church has ever known. He went on multiple mission trips. And so he's writing this to the people in Corinth. And this is what he had to say. He said in verse 24, do you not know, we're going to read through each one of these verses and we'll go back in and we'll dive in. He says, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will, be, will not be disqualified for the prize. If you go back to verse 24, John. So Paul's writing this, and he likens our life, our Christian walk, our person, this time that we have here, to a race. Some of you have been races. Some of you are not big on races at all. I personally am no longer big on races. I used to, I mean, they were fun, but I, I would rather play a sport that has, like, you keep scoring and you go against someone and usually as a ball you bounce or throw or hit or whatever, but some people like to run. You might want to get checked out if that's you, but that's just me personally, but I just don't like running. But we all understand the race. It says, it says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? So there's one person that gets first place. Now they've changed this over the years, so they put, you know, like age limitations and different people. So that person finished first and their their age bracket, and that was the fastest guy, and that was the fastest girl, and they do all these things. But at this time, there was one person that got the trophy. Nowadays, everyone gets a trophy, right? It's all participation. Hey, great job, your team finished last, you never won a game, and here's a trophy. There's not one person on the Browns that wanted that last year. They wanted what took place this past week. And now everyone's excited about it. It's amazing what takes place when you have those little wins. Many years ago, we were working in youth ministry, and we did this thing called uh, the Iron Athlete. And so it was the teachers versus the students. And all the students were like 7th, 8th, and ninth grade in that, in that age bracket. And the leaders, we were all probably, I don't know, in our 30s and there somewhere, late 20s, early 30s, wherever it might be. And so one of the things that, I'm, that I am positive that I am allergic to is running because every time I run, I break out in sweats. So I have to be allergic to it. Makes sense, right? So we had two events that we were going to run in. It was a 100-yard dash and the mile run. And so they never told us what event was coming next. They thought it would be fun to have it as a, as a surprise. They would pull out of a hat or whatever it might be. And I'm standing with two of my buddies. Up, up next, you know, we're going we're gonna to have one of the running events. So they 
carved out a little starting line and I'm standing there at the starting line and I look way out and as far as I could see there was like these towels laid on the ground and so I turned to my two buddies and I said there's no chance I have of winning this mile race because I, I can't even run that far and I don't want to and then the guy said up next the hundred yard dash and I looked out and I was like oh my goodness a hundred yard dash a football field looks small in a stadium but when there's nothing else around it looks forever and so I turned to my two buddies and said, there's not a chance I'm even going to try and run. There's just no way. And so the guy next to me says, me neither. I'm like, okay. So they said, on your mark, set, go. And so everyone, all the kids take off and they're running all over the place and falling down and all that stuff. And we start to walk and we're going to finish dead last. We're going to finish third to last, second to last, and dead last. And this guy next to me, as he's walking, he's just kind of staring out and looking, you know, all the kids running and stuff like that. He was like, this reminds me of a race I once had. He's like, I was going against a kid and I was sure that I was faster than him. But everyone told me, no, 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 he's faster than you. And I, he said, no, I'm faster than him. And so it got going back and forth with the two boys. And he was like, you want to bet? You want to bet? I'll race you. I'll race you. And so they had, they got out where they're standing next to each other. And there was a guy who was going to start them. And then there was someone that was on the other end at 100 yards. And they were going to be the finish line. And, and there were two people there so they could both watch. And they determined who the winner was. So the guys here at the beginning on your market set go they both said okay we're gonna go at your market set go he said our market set go and he goes I take off and he goes and I'm running and he goes and I'm, I'm I'm ahead he goes I know I have this he goes about halfway into it I don't know why but I decided I'd kind of look back and when I looked back I kind of lost my balance a little he goes and I righted myself but it allowed the guy to catch up with him me and then actually pass me so I tried to kick it back in and I see the two guys were getting closer and closer and closer and I'm just about there. He goes and I get to the very end and I do the only thing that I can know to do and he goes and I dive head first to win the race. He goes, it was on cinders. He goes, it used to, you know, now when I was, you know, they had these, they had these rubberized track, now it was all cinders and he said, and I ripped my arms and my legs and he said, I had, I was picking cinders out of it that night. It was unbelievable. I go, that's awesome. So you won? He goes, no. <laughs> he said, still to this day, I think I won. But the two guys said I didn't. And so then I said, are you sure it wasn't a tie? And they're like, you lost. And he's like, I've never run a race since. He goes, and I'm never going to run a race again. He goes, because I still haven't gotten over it. And I, we're walking this whole time and we're going and I'm like, oh man, and this should be this deep story, you know, and he's sharing this whole thing and it's his childhood and he's you know, kind of emotional about it and I'm picturing him diving and all that kind of stuff and my buddy, my other buddies with this, he's, he's like super calm. He's like, yeah, he's like, you know, that would be tough and he's being really, you know, a calming force, all that kind of stuff and I finally looked at him and I go, you're an idiot and he's like, I know, I've been waiting for someone to tell me that for how long? He goes, what was I thinking? He goes, but I wanted to win so bad. He goes, so I just dove head first. He goes, but why? Why did I look back? He goes, all it took was one glance. I lost. He goes, I had the guy. If I would have just focused on forward and kept running forward, he goes, I look back. He goes, and I still deal with it to this day. This guy's 30-something. This was like when he was like in high school and there somewhere. All to win, and, and, he, and he never ran again. But that's our life when it comes to the race. See, he saw two people, one guy won, even though he was sure that he won and he was willing to do whatever it was. But halfway through, he had to look back. How many times do we stop and look back? How many times do we not have the self-control to focus on forward? And just for a moment, we look back and we lose sight of the prize. See, it used to be only one person got the prize. But in our Christian walk, You've already won. So knowing that you've already won, knowing that even if it's a 100-yard dash or a mile run, you have already won, shouldn't the fruit of the Spirit rise in you in such a way so that other people will want to want run the race with you? And that's what Paul's presenting to us. So when it comes to our self-control, People need to see this so they can see that, yes, there is a chance that I too can run. There is a chance that there is a race that's out there for me. There is a prize that is there, and it's bigger than I even realize. 
And so when Paul writes these verses, he says, do, not, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. If you are a believer, you have the prize. Are you running like that? Are you taking a few steps? You start to get a good pace. You're feeling good, and all of a sudden, well, I got to look back. I got to see, oh, that's, that's my struggle from before. That's my relationship that I messed up. That's when I made that bad decision financially. That's when I chose to go too far physically. That's when I was unkind. That's when I chose not to be good. That's why, and the next thing we know, we're all out of kilter and we can't even focus on what's before us because we get stuck behind us. Paul continues and he says this. He says, everyone, you know who everyone is? That's all of us. So we're all sitting here. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. And with the fruit, why this is, is key, the fruit of the Spirit, is because we saw that it takes time for the fruit to appear in our lives. And sometimes it's not even the fruit that's all of a sudden there. The weeds start to creep in, and we start to say, no, 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 I'm going to continue to grow. I'm going to continue to flourish before God. And then it's the flowers that suddenly show up, and we realize that we're on the right pace. But just like that field... There are, feet, there are plants everywhere that are flowering everywhere. And we need to continue until that fruit is evident. And we need to continue until the vine dies and they can only see the fruit. Because if they don't, if the fruit is not sharing, there's no way they can ever see the vine. As a believer, for everyone that is a believer, that vine is Jesus. That vine is who God gave for your sins and for my sins. That vine is the one who died in that cross but rose again later. Three days. Do we run daily? Do we have the self-control daily to show and to share that with others? The verses continue. He says, make sure I have this. If they do it, oh, go back, I'm sorry. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So we have to know what's at stake. We have to understand that our lives are more than temporary. We have to understand when people say to you, I, uh, my friend Ryan turned 35 today and Mary Ann's going to turn 80 this Wednesday. Isn't that awesome? And some of us are like, oh my goodness, I would love to live to 80. And some of us are like, 80? I can't imagine living to 80. Some of you teenagers are like, 35? I can't imagine living to 35. And you think, oh, it's going to be forever, and boom, you're going to blink. 18 to 30 goes like nothing. And you're looking back and you're going to go, what happened? Slow down. Slow down. Because none of us know, we all know the beginning line, none of us know when that finishing line is. But it says this, it says, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So what's at stake? Eternity is at stake. Your eternity, my eternity, and the people that are running the race alongside of us. And the people that are sitting on the sidelines, that are sitting in their chairs, the people that may not even show up to the parade, the people that are at home right now on Sundays, the people that have no encouragement, the people that are lonely, the people that are beat up by this world, that no one's cared enough to say, hey, would you just come along and sit alongside me on Sunday? The ones that we choose not to be an example in front of, to show that fruit before them. Folks, if you're a believer, this is on us. If you're a believer, this is on us. You're running the race. And even though your pace may be slow, people are watching. People are noticing. Do you have the self-control to show the kindness and the goodness and the love and the joy and the peace that God has blessed you with daily? Because there's something way bigger at stake than you and me. And there's something way bigger at stake than this life. And there's something way bigger at stake than just one win. Eternity. The verses continue. Verse 26 is therefore. Anytime we say therefore, we stop and say, what's it there for? The next thing he says is, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. So what he is saying here is this. If you're going to run, run with purpose. Every single moment counts. Every moment as a grandfather, as a grandmother, every moment as a mom, a dad, every moment as a brother, as a sister, every moment as part of a family, as a friend, every moment for someone you've never even met, every moment, whether the person is homeless, 
or has all the money in the world, every moment matters. Because what's at stake? Eternity. So don't just run and not know what you're running for. There's a finish line. And the finish line is forever. But when you do so, do so with purpose. Some of you sitting here right now, you hate your job. You hate it. You're already thinking about, man, I got to get up tomorrow. I got to get up this time. I'm going to go through the, the whole week in this rut that I'm in. And it drives me crazy. And I've got to do this. And I've got to do this. And I've got to take care of this. I've got this appointment. This boss is going to yell at me. I got to deal with that employee that I can't even stand. All these things, you're already there. And we don't look at it that this is part of our race. And when God entrusts me with these small things, he'll entrust me with more and more and more. When I start to view things through his eyes, when I start to see that the vine may have died, but the fruit that is here is each one of us as believers. So don't run aimlessly. Run with intent. Run with purpose. But listen, halfway through, don't start looking back. Because when you look back, you can't see the finish line. And it's a finish line that none of us know where it is. God wants us to stay focused on him. Yeah, but I screwed this up. Yeah, so did I. Yeah, but I'm such a mess up. Yeah, so am I. Yeah, but you don't know my sin. Yeah, well, you don't know mine either. Sin is sin. And whether you miss the mark by an inch or a mile, if God is the intended target, you missed. We're all there. The Bible says we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Don't look back. Focus on forward. Let all these things, the fruit of the Spirit, rise within you. But don't just do it to do it. Do it with purpose and intent. Verse 27, he says this. He says, no, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Listen to that again. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Here's the thing that's amazing. When you get to the finish line and you don't know when that is, none of us know the age, none of us know the time, none of us know if Jesus is coming back. He'd come back in an instant. None of us know. Talks about that in the Bible. But when that happens and when we have run that race, Everyone shares in that victory. And so if you will break it down one victory at a time. I enjoyed the time that God gave me with the people that God blessed me with that poured love into me and I had the opportunity to pour love into them as opposed to, how did I miss out on this? I mean, I could have been enjoying this all this time. I could have had all these wonderful things happening. I could have done so much good. I could have spread so much love and so much joy. And you're looking back. You're looking back. Back on struggles. Back on the past. Back on where you don't even have the strength to look for because the devil's got you. So therefore, run with intent and run with purpose and be thankful in those moments and grab a hold of them and know that in the end, each time we share in those victories where we show and share the fruit of the Spirit, it's victory after victory after victory until we can all get together and share in that prize. October 20th is a day that we as a church, we're just giving away pumpkins. That's how some people would look at it. But it gives us kind of a small finish line that others would say, wow, we get to reach out to all these kids in the preschool. Why we get to reach out to your nieces and nephews and your grandkids. Why we get to reach out to 
to your family and friends. We get to reach out to each other. We just happen to be using fruit because of messages we taught around the fruit of the Spirit. But it's just one day, which is a finish line. And it's enjoying those victories all the way through. And in each victory, instead of looking back, I had the self-control through all the fruit of the Spirit working through me that I was able to love just as God loves me. And in each moment, and in each hour, and in each day, God changed me from the inside out. And I made a choice. I'm no longer going to look back because I'm running with purpose and intent. Imagine what that looks like in your life. To stay focused on forward and knowing I have already won and knowing that every fruit will be evident in every moment that God has blessed me with. And I get to love and I get to share joy and God brings me peace and somehow I found patience and through it I was kind and I chose to be gentle and his goodness instead of just being good did amazing things through me to the point where through my faithfulness that I was able to rest in him knowing that my self-control was really the Holy Spirit's control through me. What's that look like for you? Right where you sit, if you could just close your eyes for a moment. I'm going to read to you this final prayer that we started with from a gentleman named John Stott. His praise team comes up. 90 years old. As you're sitting here, I'd love for you to have a conversation with God just to talk to him about this fruit and how it grows through each one of us. And this is what John Stott started every day with, to stay focused on the prize and focused on forward. He said, Holy Spirit, I pray that this day you will fill me with yourself. Your fruit in my life. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And in every moment that I get the opportunity to understand that there's more at stake, and in every moment that I get to focus on the prize and on the finish line, and in every moment, every moment, that you can control me from the inside out and that my self-control will show all of those things because every moment matters and every person in my life matters. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this time together. Lord, as we come to you, help us to see you in every moment. Help us to battle in such a way that in every moment we have purpose and intent. Help us to love and care for moments or for every person, God. Help us to know that each person that you bring in our life, Lord, is there for a reason. God, help us to not look back. Help us to focus on the finish line that we don't even know where it's going to be. But in the end, in every one of those moments that we get to share victory with you, with the people that you bless us with every day. Lord, we love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you all please stand?